Hello and welcome to HD Live, the streaming video service of Health Day News. I'm Mabel Jean. Currently, more than 170 research teams around the world are racing to find a COVID-19 vaccine, with some making bold promises that a vaccine could be available for widespread deployment in January. Is that realistic? And how do you roll out a mass vaccination program like this one? Joining me now is Dr. Amish Adalja, Senior Scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, and Dr. Kelly Moore from the Vanderbilt School of Medicine, and also Associate Director for Immunization Education at the Immunization Action Coalition. Vaccines normally require years of testing and then even more time to produce at scale. How successful does a vaccine have to be in the efficacy trials for it to be considered successful? And what's particularly challenging about creating this one? Well, what we're hearing about is that we are looking at 50% efficacy. That means that the vaccine gives you a 50% less chance of getting infected with it than somebody who hasn't been vaccinated. But I think that's, that's a, a number that I think is important, but there's also other added effects of a vaccine that might also be really instrumental. So for example, if a vaccine, even though if you get infected, you, you're less likely to be hospitalized or less likely to die, those are still very valuable propositions with the vaccine. So we may not in this first generation of vaccines get what's called sterilizing immunity, but we may get something that modulates the severity of infection. And that would be huge because that's what this has mostly been about is trying to keep our hospitals and their capacity mm -hmm. uh, manageable. And if we can keep people out of the hospital, that would really change the way we deal with this virus. The challenge is that we have never made a human coronavirus vaccine before. There are some animal, human, animal coronavirus vaccines that veterinarians use, but we haven't done this and we're doing it on the fly in the middle of a pandemic using some new technologies that didn't exist maybe 10 years ago. And that makes it easier to get to a vaccine candidate, it makes it easier to get to phase one clinical trials, but then we have the challenge of using a new technology. And I think that that's why people are really eager to see what happens in phase three clinical trials, where we're in investigating this vaccine in larger portions of the population, mm -hmm. looking for side effects, looking to see how well it does actually against the virus using techniques that we haven't had the chance to use yet against infectious diseases. We're it's optimistic, but I think it is gonna be something that is a, a challenge. It's a tremendous undertaking. Do you foresee that it's one vaccine for everyone? And can this vaccine ultimately offer complete protection? Is that what we're aiming for in the end? There are going to be multiple vaccines that probably cross the finish line and make it through to an emergency use authorization. And we may have different vaccines that work different in, in, in different populations, just like we do for flu, for example. We, we recommend high dose or adjuvanted flu vaccines for elderly populations, nasal flu, flu mist for, for younger populations. So there may be differences that we'll see. I don't think that what we're going to see though with this first generation is something that's akin to the measles vaccine where this is basically done. I think there probably will be refinements and improvements on the vaccine that we'll see in second and third generation vaccines that will be more like our traditional childhood vaccinations. But right now we need something that keeps people out of the hospital and changes the course of this pandemic. So I think we can, we can really accept something that isn't the, the best vaccine, but one that's good enough to get us through this acute part of the pandemic. Okay. Now, ultimately, billions of doses of several types of vaccine will be needed. How big of a challenge does that present to manufacture, distribute, and administer across the U.S.? Dr. Moore, you were the director of the Tennessee Immunization Program in charge of handling the H1N1 vaccine during the swine flu pandemic in 2009. What can be learned from that experience? Well, I think there are a lot of lessons we can learn, but the challenge we face now is really the largest mass vaccination and most complex mass vaccination program we've ever attempted. Uh, back in 2009, uh, we did have a nationalized pandemic vaccination program. So the federal government invested in the development of these vaccines. It uh, encouraged the rapid production of them, just like we're seeing now. And, and it purchased the vaccines and made it available to people across the country um, in, in a nationalized program. So that is very similar to how we will do things with the coronavirus vaccine. What is, uh, we also at that time had seven different formulations available. So we had different brands with different age indications. But what was really one of the most important ways that it was much simpler back then is that we only needed one dose for almost everyone to be protected from the H1N1 influenza virus. Um, in addition, we were building influenza vaccines that were 
It was built on the backbone of our seasonal influenza vaccination uh, manufacturing and production models. So it came out as a licensed FDA approved vaccine. With coronavirus vaccines, they're new vaccines. And also we have the issue of potentially two doses of vaccine being needed for each person to be fully protected. Um, and anything that requires two doses is, is much more complicated uh, than a one dose vaccine program because getting that person in to complete their series and protect them uh, requires an extra level of effort we didn't have to make before. So the logistics are complicated. Um, are we in any way preparing already for this or are people waiting until we actually have a vaccine to spring into action? We're absolutely preparing right now. Um, I wish we had started preparing even earlier, uh, but there were challenges at the federal level in making some decisions about who is going to be in charge of vaccine distribution and implementation. I think some of those are being sorted out now and the states are certainly preparing for uh, these vaccine distribution programs reaching out to their traditional partners in immunization because most vaccines in the U.S. are delivered in the private sector. Very, very small percentage of vaccines are delivered by public health. And so we partner with uh, the private sector hospitals, clinics, as well as pharmacists to administer vaccines to the general public. Now, the coronavirus vaccine plans also will include special plans early in the, in the pandemic vaccine program uh, to target critical infrastructure folks, the highest priority recipients. When we have small numbers of vaccines available at the very beginning, we wanna get those just to the right people who need them most to keep our society functioning, to take care of the sick um, and others who are most critical. And so we may see some different strategies than we've seen before to get those early doses just to the right people. And then we'll see a more traditional vaccination program later when we're trying to vaccinate broadly across the general public. And I will say one of our best partners will be those private clinics and pharmacies who give, say, lots of seasonal flu vaccine every year. Uh, we'll be building on that infrastructure to push this vaccine out more broadly to the public and make it accessible. Mm -hmm. well, let's get back to that in a bit. Uh, Dr. Adalja, are there early indications that people won't want this shot? And how does that impact the immunization effort to end the pandemic? This is going to be one of the most crucial parts of the vaccination campaign. We know, for example, uh, during H1N1 that we had a very low uptake. I think it was around 23% of the U.S. population took the H1N1 vaccine, which is much lower than our seasonal flu numbers. So this is going to be a challenge, especially in this age where there's lots of misinformation, there's been lots of politicization of this, uh, there's been even speculation about the vaccine already, even before we even have a vaccine. So we are going to want to get as many people as we can vaccinated, and it's going to be important for infectious disease doctors and, and family physicians and public health advocates to really talk about the risks and benefits of this vaccine and be very transparent about the data so that we get this high vaccine uptake. And we have to be very proactive at combating anti-vaccine messages and vaccine hesitancy messages that are going to be out there uh, because they are going to be out in full force uh, guaranteed just by how this pandemic has gone from the beginning. And uh, we don't want anybody to you know, sow doubt in the efficacy of the vaccine if it is indeed shown to be efficacious and safe, because this is the only way that we really get this virus under control and remove it as the threat that it is. Okay. Now, Dr. Moore, you have experience with perhaps the language that people can use when talking about the vaccines um, through your work with the Action Coalition. Can you give us some guidance there? Absolutely. I think one of the things we need to reassure people about right now is that questions are normal and appropriate. Even I have questions about how the vaccine will work and how many doses I need and what the side effects will be. So if I have questions, then it's perfectly normal for everyone to have questions. So I take that 30% uh, hesitancy number right now with a grain of salt because we need to get answers to our questions from these phase three clinical trials that are going on. And then it's our job to communicate with the public, to partner with them, uh, being very transparent about how well this vaccine works, what we can expect of it, and what the side effects are, especially if we think we're gonna need to give two doses to people. They need to understand if they should expect a sore arm or a little bit of fever for a day or two as the vaccine works so that they know what's normal and expected 
And we also need to be focusing on making it easy for them to come in for that second dose. So they understand they're not fully protected until they've had both doses of the vaccine for those vaccines that end up requiring two. You mentioned uh, private partners, uh, the clinics, for instance, out um, that will be very involved in rolling out this program. Should they be preparing in a specific way now to, to take that on? Seasonal influenza vaccination programs this fall are the perfect warm up game for the big game with COVID-19 next year. So I think that for those clinics that give seasonal influenza vaccines, they need to be looking at how they vaccinate every person in their practice. That should be their goal. And they should be thinking about how to do that safely, how to bring patients in, how to reassure them that they're not at risk of being exposed to COVID-19 while coming in to get vaccines, because that's a concern that some people in the public have. They want to avoid the healthcare system to avoid COVID-19. It's our job to show them that they can be vaccinated safely and that they need this influenza vaccine to protect them from influenza this fall. But it also gives us practice at doing what we need to do quickly with influenza then to focus on COVID-19 uh, in a few months, a few months from now if we're rolling this out on a large scale. Mm -hmm. So those are the kinds of changes practices can work on right now. Okay, uh, Dr. Adalja, are you concerned or watching carefully the logistics, uh, basic things like having glass, enough glass vials, um, platforms to move those vials, refrigeration? I understand that some of these vaccines in the end will need to be refrigerated because they're ineffective if, if they're at room temperature. These are very basic concerns that perhaps people should be working on now. Yes, this, lots of people think that once you've gotten through the clinical trials, the vaccine is just going to magically appear in doctor's offices, and that's not the case. We have to think about the, the glass that you store it in, the rubber stoppers on top, the syringes that you inject it in. This, this like Dr. Moore said, is going to be one of the biggest vaccination programs that we've ever done, probably the biggest. So we have to think about all of the supply chain, chain elements and anticipate where things might go wrong. And in, in glass vials, stoppers, inject uh, syringes, needles. We need to think about also the cold chain because like you said, some of these vaccines do require pretty cold storage that you, you really have to think about how are you going to move the vaccines from their point of manufacture to the doctor's office and can you keep that cold chain intact? And that becomes really challenging when you think about vaccinating in the developing world where there may be spotty electricity, for example, for the freezers. So this is something that we have to think about now and we have to anticipate that there are going to be hiccups that this rollout isn't going to be as perfect as it sounds. And, and I do think that, that there are groups involved in this now, including the Department of Defense. We're hearing about McKesson being involved, multiple groups trying to make sure that this actually ends up in people's arms because a vaccine that doesn't get into people's arms or gets spoiled because the cold chain was broken is not an effective vaccine. Right, right. And of the people's arms, Dr. Moore, who's gonna get this first? Who's gonna be in line first? <laughs> <laughs> Those decisions are being worked on right now by uh, the Federal Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, uh, as well as uh, the National Academy of Medicine committee that has been convened to think about broadly the ethical framework for getting the vaccine to those who should have it first. There's a lot of different ways we could approach who gets the vaccine first, but I think one of the consistent um, feelings across everyone I talk to is that healthcare professionals should be at the front of the line. Uh, they put themselves in harm's way occupationally in order to take care of the rest of us, particularly in those hospital settings where there are very few people who have the specialized skills to work in those hospitals and care for the sickest patients. We need to make sure that as part of our social contract with those who put themselves in harm's way, that we make sure that they're vaccinated and fully protected so that they can keep doing their jobs um, to take care of the rest of us. So I think we anticipate that probably healthcare professionals and others in critical infrastructure roles whose jobs compel them to put themselves in positions where they may be exposed to COVID-19, uh, those are likely to be towards the top. Then the next group that's also going to be towards the top will be those who are likely to suffer the serious medical consequences from the infection with the virus. So we may be looking at how do we protect those in nursing homes, long-term care facilities, meat packing plants, and other places where we've seen serious outbreaks, educators in the school system, 
One group you won't see at the top of the list that you often see with influenza are children. We're not testing these vaccines in children right now, and, and the, the priority is unlikely to be children at first. Uh, that's just because of the unique nature of this particular coronavirus and our focus on protecting adults. Um, so that's something that people may assume, but in fact, we're going to be focusing on adults in this case. We are working through this at a breakneck, breakneck pace. Uh, Dr. Dalja, any concerns that we're skipping steps? No, I don't have any concerns that we're skipping steps. We, when we talk about this as being Operation Warp Speed, what's Warp Speed is getting things into clinical trials and then manufacturing. It's not the clinical trials. That's going to still take the same time. And people are frustrated that it's going to take some time to get through a phase three clinical trial with tens of thousands of people. So what we really exp expedited here is getting the development going and we're already starting to think about manufacturing before we know whether this is going to work or not. That's really unprecedented because usually you wait for phase three clinical trial results and then you start manufacturing. But we know with this pandemic, there's no time to waste. So this new program by the, by the government will likely expedite how quickly we go from knowing that this works, getting an emergency use authorization from the FDA to being able to start rolling out the vaccination program because we already have maybe tens of millions of doses available. And I think that's going to be the key, what, key thing because we don't want to have the vaccine being available much later than we need it, which in, some of that happened during H1N1 where the vaccine wasn't available as quickly as we needed it for the peak of infection. Right, right. Do you have anything to add to that, Dr. Moore? I completely agree with Dr. Adalja. It's, um, it's something that we struggled with in 2009. Of course, in 2009, we recognized the pandemic strain at the end of April, and we were rolling out vaccine at the first week of October. However, in that situation, uh, even though we went from April to October and had a vaccine ready to roll, uh, the virus had different plans, and it started rolling as soon as school went back into session in, in August and September around the country. So uh, whenever we're conducting a pandemic vaccination program, that's one of the variables we can't control is the virus's behavior. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so it is absolutely critical that we shorten the steps wherever possible. And as Dr. Adal just said, we need to assure people that we are not cutting steps that will affect our ability to know that this is safe. We're not, we're not taking shortcuts. We are simply streamlining the process to get a safe and effective vaccine to the public as quickly as humanly possible. All right, Dr. Kelly Moore from the Vanderbilt School of Medicine. Dr. Amish Adalja, Senior Scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. Thank you, thank you so much. And thank you for joining us for this session of HD Live, the streaming video service of Health Day News. For more health news, remember to check us out at live.healthday.com on our Facebook page at Health Day News, and on Twitter at Health Day Tweets. I'm Mabel Jones.